Hey, Link here. Thanks for joining me for episode 83, where I speak with Raymond Cripps, developer of Project Feline. In this episode, we talk about how they got into making games, games that they enjoy the most, a game that they feel does not get enough credit, their life outside of gaming, and words of wisdom. We also run through three amusing lightning round questions. Before we get started, don't forget there are links in the episode description that you can follow to learn more about Raymond as well as the podcast. Also, don't forget to like and share the episode, and without further ado, enjoy episode 83. Hi, and welcome to the Red Tunic Podcast, a podcast where I look to rediscover what makes gaming fun and enjoyable by having positive conversations with those related to the industry. My name is Link, and today I'm joined by Raymond Cripps, who has contributed to projects such as Guardian's Call, Blade Construct, and is currently working on their upcoming project, er, their upcoming game, Project Feline, and as well has his YouTube dev devlogs. Hi, Raymond. How are you doing today? Doing pretty good, Link. Thanks for asking. Glad to be here. Yeah, you know, I'm happy to have you here. Um, you know, for, for anyone listening, there was a little bit of, um, I don't want to say headache getting everything set up. Uh, there was a bit of back and forth only because unfortunately, the first day we were supposed to talk, uh, there was like a, a massive uh, thunderstorm and it took out your power for a while. Oh, and then yeah. you unfortunately got COVID. Um, so yeah, I'm happy that we're we're finally able to work this out and we're able to, uh, we're able to talk and, you know. we Yeah, uh, we, we finally got it there. The prophets really didn't want me to come talk to you, but I, I fought my will. I, I willed my way into it. I made a bargain with the devil and it allowed me to be here on this very afternoon. And, um, yeah, man. Yeah. The weather can get pretty crazy down in Australia, but we endure and survive. That's how we do it. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And hopefully, because you know, this is a rather small podcast. I hope it was not expensive deal with the devil that you had to make because, you know, otherwise you, you, uh, you over you overpaid quite a bit <laughs> no it wasn't too bad i had to like i had to replace uh, a few network switches because of this there was like this lightning strike that just took out uh a lot of like the entire street was down and for whatever reason my my network switches just s stopped working so but i need those anyway for, for other stuff for, for connection to the whole world so replacing i just had to replace some of that Small price to pay to continue to be allowed access online, I suppose. But um, yeah, let's just hope there's no more of that happening. If one happens at this, it's sunny right now, but if something happens at this very moment, <laughs> I'm going to be so angry. But uh, uh, you know, yeah. at that point, I think it would be real fair to say the prophets do not want us speaking. Um, <laughs> however, Raymond, you're here now, so I'm going to bug you with questions. So please do. We get before we get started, though, would you mind telling me and anyone listening a little bit about yourself and maybe your current projects? Sure. Um, so I am a I'm an indie game developer slash YouTuber slash streamer, I suppose. Um, I am working on this game called Project Feline, which is like my dream game. I started working on it as like a side project it was just because I, I don't know, I just wanted to make something that I thought was cool. Uh, I'd made a few little prototypes before then, and I just really wanted to make like just a combination of all the stuff I thought cool. So I, I'm going for like the sort of anime art style with the game. It's a 3D platformer. It has like high speed momentum mechanics in it. I've been working on it for a few years now and making videos on YouTube about it and doing live streams showing the development. And uh, it's been a pretty fun ride. I didn't have a lot of experience going in and i've sort of just been learning as i go and i've been sharing all of the just the stories the kind of stuff that comes up during development uh just with people online and a lot of people come to watch and uh they give like feedback on the game and that sort of thing and it's it's just been a really fun adventure so far not just on building the game but sort of engaging with the community around it as well and uh i'm currently still on that on that journey i have a lot of work ahead of me still but uh, I'm just taking it a day at a time, learning what I can, and trying to make a really cool game, at least uh, to my to my own standards, anyway. And um, yeah, I guess that's a bit about me in, in terms of uh, just my just what I'm up to. So you know, thank you for for that. You know, I um, 
I, I'm not going to lie. I did not know the full breadth of how you managed everything. I originally, I think, um, learned about you um, a, a good a good while ago. Um, for you know, for for your own knowledge, or for anyone else that's listening's knowledge, how I usually um, find guests or uh, for the people I'd like to speak to, I have like a giant um, uh, a, a, a notepad uh, document um, tabs like everything and like. I found you, um, I actually found your game, because I believe you post as the main character for Project Feline as well to promote the game. Oh, no, that, that's not me. That's the main character. She she writes Sorry. those posts. Correct. Right, right. Exactly. So I learned, I found your main character, I, I found her Twitter, and then that's I it. found you from that. Um uh, but what I'm what I'm getting at is, you know, I I think like the idea of the game is really interesting. I um uh I'm forgetting the name of this old PS3 game now. Um, but like uh there was a character like that, like a, a cat girl that you know did stuff. Um, it was a side scroller game. As cat game. girls do. Um, <laughs> as cat girls do. Um, Maybe but stuff. that was that was one of the things I found most amusing. I was like, oh hey, this is like a really neat character because i like the character design from the other one i thought it was interesting that you know it's it's not um um it what what i'm jump or fumbling through here is to say that one of the things i found most interesting about the game was the fact that it's uh, a unique character that it's not just um another dude doing things uh and that's like one of the things that made me uh interested and follow along and 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 everything there sorry that was a really weird roundabout way just to say why how, how i originally got interested in the game that's a really interesting story like i think that's certainly i i don't think i've ever had someone find me like that so that's really cool i'll, I'll pass on my compliments to my old gal gabby here the main character i'm sure she'll be pleased to hear that but um yeah, it that, that most I think I where I get most people coming across me is just on YouTube, where I, I have all my videos and stuff. But I yeah I, I I I made her an account, my main character, just in case like I don't know, just for fun, in case she wanted to say anything because you know she's she's got a big personality. But we're we're both so busy on the game a lot. So yeah, that was cool that we were able to find her through that. That's I don't think I've had anyone. It's never happened before. So maybe I ought to, I ought to get her tweeting more. I gotta nag her to, to tweet out more stuff to get me more interviews. You know, maybe when if, she's old enough, she could do her own interviews someday. That'd be sick. You know, may, maybe maybe yeah, that'll work out. Um, you know, I I'm not gonna lie. Unfortunately, um, as I'm sure you and everyone else has noticed for their own uh, Twitter stuff, that you know, Twitter doing what Twitter's doing, uh, a lot of things just don't exist anymore. So you know, yeah, I hope you know it would be it would be great to see uh posts from older uh older accounts or or what have you popping off again you know what i mean oh i think so yeah i well it, it's changed so much they don't even call it twitter anymore i hear the kids today they call it x.com or something i don't know i don't keep track of it all i just try to i just use it to kind of post uh little clips to try and get podcast interviews and that's that's sort of all i really <laughs> kind of use twitter for mainly and i look and, and i follow like a few artists there too there's like a I really like following like Y2K aesthetic uh, accounts that just post like old graphic design magazines from like 20 years ago. I find that's pretty cool. That's that's kind of my knowledge of Twitter or X.com is just uh, it's just that basically. But um, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting site. That's for sure. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so you know, Raymond. I am curious, if you don't mind sharing, uh, how is it you got into developing and making games? Um, I, I will tell you, but don't tell the prophets I said this. So I got a, I got into development when I was, I was pretty young. I was about maybe 11 years old and it literally started. I was just typed into Google how to make a video game. Cause I, I, I was like playing like a couple games at the time. And every time I get my hands on anything, I want to just, especially when I was little, I just wanted to make my own version of it. So I would, I would like watch you know, like Bakugan on TV in the morning, and I would want to make my own version of that. I play, you know, certain games, want to make my own thing of them. So I, I went, oh, how do you actually do that? And I typed in that into Google, and I found some, some really old tutorial from oh, these two Dutch guys, I think. And it, this was like, bef this was for Unity Engine. This was like before it kind of took off. This, it was still like paid, I think, at the time. 
and but they were like the only guys that have this like comprehensive tutorial series on how to make some game in it and i just followed it and uh you know tutorials you 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 try to follow it step by step and it still doesn't work so i had to do a lot of my own like working out and figuring things out and then i liked it so much that i kind of never stopped and all through high school i was like making little prototypes uh, I tried making like a Slenderman style game and a like a 3D platformer and a third person shooter. I, I just kind of like tried anything that sounded cool. They were all super jank and coded very badly, but uh, it was fun. And it was, I had this idea in my head of like this, of, of a game that would be like the best game to make ever. Something that had like parkour in it and fast movement. And that eventually led me to, um, I guess to do pro finally do Project Feline, which is sort of that exact vision. But um, in between that, like I, I started just learning the engine. I messed around with it, and then after about like eight years, I left school and enrolled in some. It was it was some like game, some animation course, and I didn't really learn much from it. But it was through there I was able to get a gig teaching game development. So all the stuff I had taught myself in Unity with tutorials over the years, I would then pass on to uh, the two other people. So I was teaching like uh, some programming, animation, and stuff. And then while I was doing that, uh, I was uh, I started Project Feline on the side as like a side thing because I just I I made a bunch of these like game jam games and stuff, and I wanted to do something that was a bit bigger and more ambitious. Because after you make like a dozen, you just get like small little flappy bird tier games it just get it gets kind of boring so it was during then i started feline and then i sort of uh, led me to my current arc in life right now but uh yeah it all started with that one google search when i was 11 just how do i make video game and uh yeah that's what led me here so you know thank you for sharing that's really that's really funny that you you know that you go through i think the same thing a lot or sorry you went through the same thing that a lot of people I think have went through when it comes to tutorials where you know you you do your best to follow exactly what it's saying and like you know you you're done you're like something's off here something's wrong and it's yeah you know it's always a mix of like did i make a typo was the tutorial any good um because you know as as i'm sure you've learned and seen sometimes the tutorial has assumptions that you know how to do certain things um uh, and then, you know, you don't, and then you don't do those certain things because you didn't know you were expected to, and then nothing works. Like I'll use, um, for example, a lot of, uh, Photoshop tutorials or what have you, um, would just say, oh, you'll do this, 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 but it like briefly brushes over some of something else instead of just saying, you know, go to the menu, click this, click this, click this. It just says, do this. But like, it says it in such a, a blase way that it's just like through the line that if you don't know that that's. A whole separate thing that you have to do a certain way it doesn't end up working right so um so yeah as i'm sure you you know had I, i'm oh, sure yeah. you enjoyed that same frustration in terms of programming because i know i certainly Very much. have oh yeah well it i felt it even more when I, I i had made a few tutorials before um when i started doing youtube like i would get questions to like how did you do this and that and i would try to make a tutorial style video and yeah when you when you try and make a tutorial you realize like oh this is why this is why most of the ones I've watched haven't been so good because it is quite hard to to know that oh someone else might not know this you ha you have to have like a sixth sense of like what will be assumed knowledge and what won't and um, that was something I learned while teaching too is that yeah a lot of stuff that you think is natural is kind of doesn't come naturally a lot of the time and you have to really make sure that it's like from an outsider's perspective it'll make sense so anyone that does do that well I have a lot of respect for but um yeah unless you're paying like extremely close attention to every single frame every little breath or sentence in a tutorial it can be really easy to miss that stuff and it can get real exhausting especially when you're like equally as stressed out about just trying to get it working on your side and it's like is is the source material wrong and you, it's just so stressful but yeah i i endured a fair bit of that um <laughs> it's not fun but i mean it kind of has to be painful, I guess. Uh, if it was too easy, then I guess uh, I don't know. I, I think I think being able to get over that stuff is and 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 win those battles. I think is it's it's satisfying when you can do that. 
you know, I will, I will definitely speak to the satisfying aspect of that because yes, you know, there's a very nice dopamine kick that you get when something just works, right? Like something that you've oh, yeah. been fighting. So yeah, you know, 100%, I, I understand. I agree. It's very satisfying. Um, you know, especially for, for me, when it's that dopamine hit that you can just relax and, you know, you have the feel good chemicals going, you did the thing. Good job. You know, be proud yeah. of yourself. <laughs> Even if it's only 0.9% of the time, it's worth it. That's what makes it all worth it. Exactly. You know, and you know, that finally getting that, hello, sorry, finally getting that hello world to show up on the screen, you know, that's, that's the best. Yeah, oh, sorry, man. That, that's a horrible I still, I still remember my first hello world to this day, man. It was, oh, it was amazing. It was great. Such a great <laughs> feeling. Um, yeah, yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, I hesitated to make the joke and still did it. Um, uh, the joke being, you know, struggling, the, the, the big struggle to, to make Hello World show up on the screen. I definitely. Well, yeah. Well, uh, I, I've met some people that like they can't, they like they can't even navigate File Explorer. Like I, I remember teaching someone once that didn't know like what the control panel was. So I guess, you know, it can, it can be a pretty big accomplishment if you're completely illiterate with computers to get it to at least do any, to do some simple command, it can be a pretty big leap. Um, so yeah, I guess for some people, even it might be like a huge, I mean, for me, it was pretty cool. Like I remember feeling really empowered and that I was a God and could do anything. Then I, then I tried doing more complex things and realized, <laughs> okay, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not a God, but I still have a lot of control here, which is, yeah, it's, it's, oh man, it, it was, I, I just, it's just taking me back when you mention it. Yeah. To <laughs> getting the first like character to move. I remember I had, a, it was just a sphere. And, it, and I got it to respond to WASD. And I still remember vividly in my head with the default Unity blue skybox before they actually had a proper skybox. It was just the color blue. And there was no shadows. It was just gray spheres. Getting them to move, um, that was, oh man, if I could relive that, it'd be awesome. But yeah, it's, I think it's just when, when that can excite you, you know, you're in for a good, you're in for a good ride if, if you can get excited by that, I reckon. <laughs> exactly and i want to be very clear i wasn't trying to make fun of people that are excited and have struggled getting the hello world to, to work i was more making a joke that i'm a horrible programmer and i get pleased by very simple things that shouldn't be hard oh well for... <laughs> like I, I i actually think i i've a lot of the time i kind of get saddened when, when the opposite is true when like when you do something and you don't even register it as like a win and it's like oh yeah i got to say hello world now i'll move on but i i think there is something to be said for taking those small victories seriously like I, don't, I know it sounds kind of funny it's just one little function but when especially when you're working on like a long-term project you really have to like uh celebrate those tiny little wins um like it's if you don't man it's it, it gets you, you just kind of get depressed otherwise so even the little things that i do still like uh, i i recently just went and like reorganized an entire folder because some of the names were a bit off and there was it wasn't organized very well. I literally just reorganized a folder and it was like the best feeling ever because I don't know, it's, it's a victory of sorts. It's a small victory in a sea, but it's a victory nonetheless. And I feel pretty good about when, when I can get that stuff going. Because, you know, with game development, it can get so complicated and it really is made up of those little things. So if, if, if you can learn to appreciate those things, I think it's, uh, it helps uh, big time. So, you know, thank you. That is, that is actually a very good point to make that sometimes, uh, you know, especially on bigger projects, it's made up of a bunch of smaller things and being proud of the small victories is, is pro is probably one of the things that can help you stave off. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Stave off burnout, you know? So thank you. That's a very, Absolutely. very good point to make to being proud of the small, the little victories. Thanks. That's that's what's helped me out anyway. I mean, I don't know. Like, I I don't know if it's always the same for everyone, but at least for me, I I feel like I that's sort of how I get through it because I I do get asked sometimes because I I think it's it's been like a few years since I started my game and uh, there's a lot of times where I just wanted to stop because it's like oh my god this is so hard uh, like I should just I should just give up like that'd be the easy choice but then I don't know when I think back to that first memory of getting a sphere to move and how how awesome it felt i was like uh well if i can appreciate that 
if I can just keep focused on that small stuff, uh, I, I'll hopefully make it. So, you know, so it kind of just keeps mentally, keeps me in check, keeps me kind of happy. Um, and then it means that when the bigger stuff happens, it feels even better. It sort of compounds. So I, I look forward to those big victories, but they, they aren't very common, but they do come by every so often. And um, yeah, that's uh, when, when, you, when, you can, when you can get by with just being happy that the computer uh, opened the, like you, you, I don't know, you, you fix some tiny little bug, like the character accelerating slightly too slow or whatever. And if you can get it to behave, then, oh man, it's, it's, it's great. Um, but yeah, <laughs> anyway, I'm probably sounding a bit, uh, uh, probably sounding, I'm probably sounding a bit like over cause I have to just put up, I have to put up with a lot of weird little problems working on the game, but no, but I really do enjoy it. It's, uh, it, it just takes its toll when you do it a lot, but man, I, I live for those victories. You know, yes. You know, as someone who is currently working on a long, very long project, I 100% can relate and I understand and I, and I agree. Um, however, Raymond, I am curious, uh, you know, speaking of things that you enjoy, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, do you have, wow, sorry, I just blanked on, I'm horrible at transitions. <laughs> I blanked there. Um, so speaking of things that you enjoy, I'm wondering if there are like, do you have a game that you enjoy the most or do you have some games that you enjoy above others? Uh, and if they, if you do, if you mind sharing what those games would be. Oh, uh, sure. Um, my favorite, uh, I guess the games I keep coming back to, I don't, I don't have a lot of time nowadays to play a lot, but the games I do come back to from time to time, I would say are like Skyrim. I've been playing that for like 10 years on and off with the same character. And I still haven't done all the game's content because it's so big, but I can just come in and out for like an hour and feel pretty good. Um, there's also any Ratchet and Clank game I find pretty fun. Uh, I've, I've, I've played the PS2 classics and the PS3 trilogy. I've, I sometimes will try and come back to those when I can, cause they're just so fun. And, uh, I guess one game in particular that sort of shaped me a lot is the one really bad Sonic game that came out in 2006. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's a, one of my, I don't know what it is. I have a special relationship with that game. It was the first, one of the first games I owned growing up. Cause I didn't, I didn't, um, my parents didn't really, didn't want me playing video games when I was younger, but it, um, cause everyone I knew at school had like the PS2 and were playing Crash Bandicoot and, and Lego Star Wars and all these cool games. And I, I, I had to just go to their house to play it. And it wasn't until I was a bit older, uh, we, we waited long enough for, I really wanted a PS2, but my parents waited and they said, no, 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 you want the PS3. It's going to be bigger and better. So that was my first console. And one of the first games I had on it was that Sonic game. And I don't, I don't know what it is. Cause it, it kind of, it's, it's like not only one of my favorites, it's also a game that I kind of like and dislike, like I, cause everyone hates it and I understand why they hate it, but for whatever reason, I can kind of look past it and see what they were trying to do with it. and. I don't know. I just, just the attitude of the game, the aesthetic, the font choices, the music, even though it's janky as, as hell, it's just, I don't know. That's just something about it that really is magical. So every so often I'll, I'll revisit that, um, just to kind of, cause I, over time, my perspective on it sort of deepens, um, as I, cause I, I remember as I started doing my own games, I started to get curious on what the backstory was on. The development of that game and i learned a bunch of there isn't a lot of info out there on it but i i remember just like deep diving into the the drama that was happening at the studio to have it come out like that all the weird uh yeah there's a there's a there's a whole there's a big rabbit hole and so i can appreciate it now for like from a developer point of view on like what kind of weird stuff happened um and I can also appreciate it as a child who had never heard of Sonic before that game. So I didn't have a lot of, I think a lot of people had very high expectations for it, but I didn't see any of the marketing. I didn't know it was meant to reinvent the franchise. I just remember picking it up randomly and thinking it was pretty neat. So I, I wasn't, and I didn't watch uh, YouTube uh, around because there was a lot of like, that's kind of when YouTube was taking off. So there'd be a lot of like, 
IGN videos or Game Grumps or whatever that would collectively kind of bag on the game. And because I wasn't exposed to that, I, I didn't, well, I didn't know anyone else that had played it. So I had my own isolated, self-contained experience with that game. And uh, yeah, it, it probably sounds crazy to to anyone else that's played it, but I don't know. I really respect it as a game for what it was trying to do. It might not have come out uh, the, the right way at the end, but it's kind of a miracle it was even made at all, considering like, I don't know what was going on. Like the team got cut in half, the director left halfway in, like considering all that, I thought it was kind of incredible that it even released. So, um, and yeah, I don't know. There's just a certain confidence about it, even though it doesn't really hold up. I guess it wouldn't hold up today. It probably didn't even hold up back then, but <laughs> there's a certain, I don't know. There's a certain attitude about it that I haven't seen in their newer games in the, in the series. Cause I think after that, they kind of got burned and it seems like they've been afraid to go back to what was there what they were doing in 2006 because this was like before the retro they they lately i've noticed that they have a very heavy retro um like nostalgia thing going on where they constantly bring back green hill zone in every game and uh that in 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 2006 in that game it didn't have any of that stuff in it it was like really seriously trying to be this final fantasy tier story it, it was a really the game had a weird story too and that's kind of why i loved it as well is that it it dared to have this high stakes story that took itself way too seriously but to me i respect that more than like trying to play it safe and and oh remember chemical plant zone remember uh you know remember this and that's sort of that's sort of the vibe i get from them now but yeah i don't know it's uh it it, it holds a place in my heart and and the other games too, like Skyrim and uh, oh, and and uh, Halo. That's another one. I I think it's an all time classic that I'll come back to from time to time if I'm around friends. It's yeah. So th those are, those are my ones: Skyrim, Ratchet and Clank, Sonic, and Halo. So you know, thank you for sharing it. And it's always interesting to hear uh, someone's breakdown. I guess you would say of like a nostalgic game that they have and especially if the game is generally not seen in like good light cuz you know and i'm sure everyone's played some bad games and i'm sure everyone has fond memories of some bad or, or janky games and it's always interesting to hear how you know could, how like someone can look at a game uh today and like have a, that kind of like nostalgic um reflection or um uh, retrospective on it and be like yeah you know back then it was great because of these reasons and now i think it's great because of these reasons and you know those reasons uh don't always align in the case of sonic 06 i would be uh very shocked to hear that those same reasons as a kid and as an adult uh especially as an adult yourself making <laughs> games uh, to have those align but it's always interesting to hear um to hear like the differing views of that so thank you for sharing that because like it's it's like i said it's i just find that fascinating and interesting have you played sonic 06 i have not played sonic oh. <laughs> sorry i don't know why i said that so indignantly <laughs> um no no i have never um i have never really played sonic uh i haven't played sonic 06 and i'm not really uh a huge 3d sonic fan to begin yeah, with yeah I, I I I get that. I'm not. I kind of used to be, but I I wouldn't say I'm a fan anymore myself. Um, but yeah, like, it, I, like you've seen, you've probably seen gameplay of it though. I'd imagine. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's always shocked when I tell them that's like one of my favorites. But um, I don't know. Yeah, I I am kind of drawn to those very weird disaster games. I don't know what it is. I don't know. I just think it's. I just kind of, res I just respect what they try doing. Maybe they'll try it again. Maybe not. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I think the, the newest 3D Sonic game might have been them trying again, which I, you know, uh, I have not played. I have no opinion on it. The only, the only real opinion I have on Sonic 06 is that I know it's, you know, a really rough game. The same as like Sonic Boom or, or some of the other ones. Mm. Um, I think the, only other 3d sonic game i've played recently or most recent one um would have been sonic adventure the dreamcast one um oh and I've, I was, I've played a outside, little of that. 
yeah you know and I, I i've only played a little of it too i think the first level um and outside of that whatever was included in sonic generations i want to say so like you know when i when i say um i don't really play 3d sonic games it's you know as a as a by and large and not for any particular reason i just i just don't you know um i i, I imagine yeah. one day i should maybe check them out but like yeah i just i don't have a i have a lot of other things to to distract me if that makes any sense you know yeah well hopefully one of those games will be project feline one of my games um that's 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 what my hope would be anyway as a game developer that's always my <laughs> mission so yeah, but yeah, I don't blame you for not trying them. I a lot of them, I don't know. I I kind of lost interest in Sonic like ten years ago after just, I don't know. After they kind of drifted away from '06, I I guess I kind of stayed in 2006. I didn't really follow them through history to what they're doing at the moment. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's, it's probably heaps that I don't even know about that they've done. That but yeah, I don't know. Nothing's really grabbed out at me and interested me that much because uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know. It's just um maybe I don't know. I feel like maybe there's just this thing where it's like if there's like a game you liked as a kid, you'll kind of stick. At least for me, I find that I tend to just stick rigidly to stuff I liked when I was a kid and don't venture too far out uh, a lot of the time. But um that's just me though. But yeah, I uh it, it yeah, you 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 have it's a rough, it's a rough one. <laughs> but uh yeah. Probably like it's it's kind of, it might be worth to just play one level of it just so you really kind of but yeah it's uh if you've seen like enough footage of it you'll kind of get the gist maybe so you know I it it's I don't know um I don't know I'm I'm gonna assume your parents did this but I don't know uh you know the whole try one level of it just to get an idea kind of thing. that very much reminds me of you know when you're sitting at dinner when you were a child. And like your parents put like, you know, broccoli or something in front of you and like, just try one, see if you yeah. like it. And you're like, I don't want to. I know I won't. It's like, whatever. It's a, you know, it's weird green. It's like, just try it. See if you yeah. like very reminiscent <laughs> yeah, of, yeah. of that. Just, just try a level. Maybe you'll like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Um, try one of the worst games in the last 20 years. Come on. Just try it. Yeah, yeah. I, know, I, I feel that. <laughs> could, you, could you imagine if that was the pitch that they they unironically made at the time just try one level to see if you like it we dare you or something honestly I, that would have been funny i maybe that would have saved it because i think a lot of people were kind of disappointed by the image that they gave because it wasn't until years later i actually looked at the trailers and i was like oh my god they were really hyping this uh, up because it was like the next generation and it was all meant to be this big hype thing but if they had instead spun it as like look we had to rush this out for Christmas. Can you just try one little? <laughs> if they had tried that, I'm so curious how the perception, how the legacy would have been. Because I had to believe that part of the reason why I liked it and no one else did is because I didn't see the trailers and everyone who had was just really let down by them. So, yeah, I don't know. Marketing marketing's a big, it can be a big tool to kind of affect how something is perceived. So um, if they had tried that, if they had been just upfront and honest, I don't know, maybe it would have helped, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never know. <laughs> Look, there's there's two more years. We could get a we could get Sonic 26 and they could, you know, electric boogaloo it. We'll we'll see. There's a few years. They could they could try it over and then try that strategy for it and say please. <laughs> <laughs> try one level, we dare you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should try that. Maybe I should just rush out my game and then use that as a as a, as a, as a as a tactic and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, Raymond, I'm not gonna lie. I like the idea of the game you are making—a parkour um, action platformer, or however the terminology is. Um, I've and I only you know I put terminology in air quotes just because I've spoken with some people, and as you know, these kind of games they have they can have different words depending on like the level of um, the, the level of like intricacies and and all of that so i don't i don't know the full breath umbrella know. proper right but um i, I like yeah. the idea of the game you're making i would very much prefer to not try it and have it be of that same notoriety <laughs> <laughs> you would as well I, let's be honest yeah yeah you, you got a point yeah yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't want to take that road yeah 
Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I, I don't worry, Link. I'll, I'll make sure it gets done right. Um, I, I won't repeat the, I won't, I won't do the Sonic strategy. I won't, I won't rush a game out for Christmas. I promise. I will, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll spend the time. I'll do it. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's fair point. Yeah, but I'm, I'm. Thank, thanks though. I'm, I'm. I, it's always, I never am quite sure whether, you know, when you're working on something and you're in the thick of it, it's never easy to tell whether it's like interesting when you stare at it so long. So it's good to know that it's like interesting enough that you wanted to talk to me about it even because I see it every day and I'm kind of tired of looking at it. So it's, um, <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> oh, you're, you're very welcome. You know, I, I understand, like I said, I understand, the, you know, as someone who is working on a long form project um for for work and everything i very much understand the 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 i don't you know the the uh going road blind with what you're doing you know so yes but but yeah you know you're you're welcome i'm glad that that is um news that you are happy to hear you know oh we're very happy to hear so the, the day i'm not happy to hear that news you know it's over for me <laughs> yeah yes you know at that point it's it's a probably not a, Joker, probably yeah. it is time to hang up right yeah. yes it's Jover. <laughs> um so raymond i am i am curious um you know because we we just spoke about a game that you that you enjoy that i you know, i don't think you would argue doesn't get enough credit however i am wondering uh if there is a game that you have enjoyed uh, throughout your life, uh, maybe from your younger years or what have you, that you feel does not get enough credit. Oh, um, I I don't know any from my childhood because I think a lot of the games I kept, um, were pretty. You know, they they did pretty well. People give them pretty good credit. Uh, there was one game I found just recently that I had never heard of before that was really unique and it, it left an impression on me but i had never heard anyone mention it or talk about it uh and that game is uh child of eden i think it was released on playstation 3 and xbox so it's an exclusive to that generation of consoles which is probably why it's, you can't find it on steam or anything it's kind of hard to find out in the wild but it it was this sort of uh, rhythm game and it had well not even a rhythm game it doesn't well kind of it, it's a very like visual it's a it's a visual and audio treat and the gameplay itself isn't what really caught me but it was the aesthetics of the whole thing it it was a it, it's very reminiscent of like that windows 7 era of design where everything was very um eco themed and glossy and the music in particular was was oh it was really cool because because it's tied in the the game it was developed by this I don't remember the guy's name. It was some Japanese developer, but the same dude also oversaw this musical project. Uh, I think I know that the name of the musical project was called uh, Genki Rockets, I think. And that's sort of like its own thing. And they release like songs. I don't know if they're still active, but like 10 years ago, um, they, they had done, uh, they had done a few albums and that has this very like electronic pop sound. But then Child of Eden, the game, uses a lot of that music from Genki Rockets because it's the same guy that's sort of running both of them. And it turns it into this whole story of like, like a like a audio rhythm game, but also this whole story about a girl that was born in outer space and she is like returning to Earth. And it, she's like cataloging through like like the Earth computer that is like left behind all of humanity is like corrupted. And in the game, you have to play the rhythm game part of it and shoot little orbs to decorrupt the computer. And it unlocks little photos and music clips and stuff of like, you know, a, like a humanity record or something like that. That's sort of the rough the story of it. And I don't know, I don't know what it is, but I just really love that idea and the way it's presented. So I, I, I ended up like buying the, the CDs from that band because they, they remix a lot of the music in the game. And I just, I just love jamming to it. So it, it's not really as a game, I wouldn't say it's like the most uh, complex, hard to learn video game of all time, but just the vision, the, the artistry of it, it's this very like optimistic futurism type aesthetic to it, which, yeah, and I've never heard anyone mention it. Like, I literally found it at 
a like a goodwill on a shelf and the logo looked cool and i was like oh this looks kind of neat and uh yeah i it was yeah some old like xbox 360 game from like 10 years ago so child of eden i would say is i i maybe it does get credit in the communities where people know it but i i, I kind of wish i would see more stuff about it because it's just like the vibe is so cool and that's kind of it really i just like the vibe so you know thank you for sharing that and i i look I, I you know i typed up as you're ex you know explaining the whole kind of overarching um uh, uh elements of of all of the little pieces and i remember seeing this game more let me rephrase that i remember uh the one screenshot of like the manta ray um oh, and yeah. this i understand what you mean by you know the 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 eco eco thing of uh windows 7 era um or uh how or what i'm interpreting that more as is that like their their theme of windows 7 like the arrow design yeah. and all of that fun oh, stuff i love because the arrow design so this cool very much feels like a weird um a weird like version or like design a, with a similar kind of what have you um that's it's a I, I apologize it's a really hard and vague thing to say it is and if it, you if anyone that's listening like just looks up a picture of this and is from the age where they were using windows 7 when it was you know 20 years i don't remember how old windows 7 is that old enough I don't know. um maybe 15 years i want to yeah, say exactly um give or take uh you'll you'll understand what the what that means the vibe is very much it feels like the wind like it looks like windows 7 arrow design stuff it, it's a weird thing to say just it's, look up a it's screen like you'll understand. if instead of a desktop it's like if windows 7 was a planet that you could go like be it like i look at pictures of it and i'm thinking i just want i want to live there i want to go and just hang out there for the rest of my life that's awesome but uh, unfortunately, it is contained only within the circuits of my Xbox, so that won't happen. <laughs> but but it's just you know it it I feel like it's from this era of design where people were very optimistic about the future. I think that's probably why I'm so drawn to it because it, it has this very childlike, um, innocent, happy optimism, abstract, it, and it's very abstract too. Like and that's why it's kind of hard to describe. Is that you don't even really know what you're looking at when you're looking at the picture. You see a few shapes. And it's it's very vibrant and colorful, but you don't even really know what it is. And it's kind of like the future. You don't know what the future is either. But when I looked at it, I was like, man, this is going to, like, if the future looks like this, this would be sick. And then, of course, uh, it's not what happened. We fast forward 15 years and we don't live in the, the Windows 7 scape, unfortunately. But, man, yeah, I don't know. That's, it's just, yeah, I just, uh, I just really vibe with what they were going for. You know, and yeah, I, I understand that completely is I'm sure all of us have games that we, you know, that, that they speak to us on a very different level that are not always easy to put into words, right? Hmm. Yeah, so, very much. So, Raymond, I, I do want to ask this just because, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, we don't have too much time uh, together for this. You know, you have some prior engagements. Um, for me, it's it's a very late evening, so like mm. I want I want to get to this one because there are a few things I want to yep. talk about one hundred percent and not miss the opportunity. And one of those is because I like to ask people uh, speak to you know speaking with developers or what have you um, more about like who they are. So I'm wondering outside of games, what do you enjoy to do? How do you relax? Oh, hmm. I hmm. What do I do? Um. When I'm not, when I'm not like working on a game or playing a game, I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking and that's usually while I'm doing something else. So I'll spend, you know, I, I, if I had to think real hard, I do spend a lot of time researching stuff, which I don't know if that counts as relaxing, but I'll, I'll like put on some music and just read a bunch of like, I'll, I'll look out for like other indie games or, you know, whatever, just, just to like kind of learn what I can. Uh, I when I was a child I used to draw a lot. I don't do it as often now, but every so often I'll get the urge to to just draw something out and I'll stay up like all night in Photoshop creating something. Um I need to do that more often probably because uh, my skills are probably weakening. But um drawing and uh this is going to sound kind of weird. One of my one of my hobbies that I really enjoy is uh cataloging my CD collection. 
and this probably sounds like something that that, that it probably sounds like work but i because i one of the reasons i like child of eden is because the music is awesome so i'll like go and try and hunt down like music that sounds like that i'll try and find like just music that inspires me and uh cds are really cool because they're higher quality like they're very high that's a really high quality medium and um you can just sort of keep it on your computer without paying a spotify premium subscription so i'll try and like shop around for like cheap cds and then i really enjoy the process of just ripping them to my computer and like naming filling in all the metadata with the right stuff because it doesn't do that on its own it doesn't have it on the disc so you have to look at the back cover and find all the track names and even then on the on the actual cd cover there'll be like mistakes like maybe they've capitalized something wrong or the spelling isn't correct or whatever it is and just going in and like fixing that in the metadata and um and adding the the trying to find like a high quality album cover online and and embedding it into the file uh setting the right year it was released the track order i don't know what it is but i just enjoy it it's just fun because when it's when you do it and you've got this perfectly cataloged little library of music it's just really satisfying to just scroll through and see all the songs and the album covers and the track names and then listening to the music that that's also that that's also fun of course but to me <laughs> one of the things i don't like sort of with modern music how it is today with streaming is that you don't get any control over that like it just puts in all the song titles and stuff for you and then you know they'll, they'll sometimes have the mistakes spelling mistakes that are on the cd cover in the spotify release and i'm like oh they've capitalized this wrong i really want to fix it but i can't so i i just try and find like the files on like bandcamp or something and and do it myself so that's so it's kind of I don't really know if that counts as a hobby, but I, I enjoy it. And then when I'm not doing that, I'm, I'd like to walk and read. And uh, yeah, that's what I do outside. Of so, games. you know, so yeah, oh, so thank you for, no, no, that was on me. Um, but no, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I, I'm, I always find it interesting when, you know, I, I, and this is in general, because I've spoken to some people who are like, yeah, this is what I do. I don't think it counts as um like their their hobbies and like i don't know if this is a hobby or not but it's like it 100 percent is right because it's something that you enjoy doing but it sounds almost like it would be like a, a meditative kind of thing um oh yeah which is interesting to say when you think about the sorry it's interesting to say or think in the face of the fact that you have to be doing things because usually when you know you talk about meditative stuff it's something where you're just relaxing and sitting and and doing and not like having to do work with it but you know it, if it helps you if it helps you actually relax and unwind um you know regardless of what you're doing with it it would 100 percent be you know relaxing right does that make sense yeah <laughs> and I think it's it's for me I think it's a good activity because I I don't know what it is but I just can't I can't not do stuff. I don't know what it is but when I'm not doing anything I feel I feel like something's wrong like I just can't stand it so I have to just do something with my time. I find it really hard to just not do anything and and uh I don't know. I I just I just can't stand it. So I I have to like always be working on something or doing something. And I guess yeah in a way it is it's Given like how chaotic game development can get, it is by contrast very relaxing because it's like, oh, okay, I know exactly what this, the, the, when I import this CD, I know exactly how many tracks there are. There's not going to be some weird bug where the sound doesn't play or whatever because it's, I didn't make the song. It's already been made. I don't have to fix bugs. I just have to type in, it's, I guess it's just data entry, I suppose. Um, and you've already got like, you know, it, it, it's it's simpler than game development, so... I guess it seems by comparison meditative. I guess it, I also like doing chores too, which I guess in the, for the same reason is sort of med meditative because it's very like repetitive and you don't really have to think. You just have to sit there and like do it. So I, I like every week I'm always like dusting, cleaning up, uh, you know, when you're just doing laundry even. I'm like folding my shirts the right way. I just, I don't know. I enjoy those moments where I don't have some like, bug or animation glitch to worry about and it's like all i have to do is fold my shirts and put them away god that's so fun because it's it's just easy <laughs> so yeah I, uh, I i enjoy those little those little moments with that that cd cataloging or doing laundry gives you um so yeah 
you know, I I 100% understand that. As someone that used to work uh, doing customer support, um, oh, having... Man. Yeah, so here's the thing. Yeah, the job's horrible. However, the nice thing about it was I, like, the tasks came to themselves. And it was, you mm. know, call came in, call was done, that was it. And, like, the task was done. There wasn't all these other things. So similar in the sense of, like, you're folding clothes or your data, you're entering data, you have a clearly defined start, middle, and end of the task, right? And that's, yeah. that was one of the things I enjoyed the most of it. And that's, you know, in a similar way, uh, you know, outside of horrible calls, they were rarely was it stressful because it was never this thing of, well, how do I solve this problem? Having to spin on the problem, having to think hard, having to, uh, you know, debug the problem, whatever. It was very much, oh, hey, here's the, here's the song name. Oh, there is a typo. Double check it. You're like, yep, fixed. Good. And like, it's done. You know, it's done. You can feel good that it's done. And then you can move on to the next thing and the next thing. Right. And mm. if your job or your day job or what have you, your day to day is doing things that don't have that kind of um, straightforwardness, having a thing to do that is very straightforward, you know, can be very relaxing just because, you know, like you said, you know, folding clothes is, it's a, a defined start, middle, end of a task, right? So it's, I understand completely on a personal level, um, I don't, if anyone else doesn't, you know, that's one day maybe, but I 100% I understand how and why, you know, you like how those things yeah. might not be relaxing to some but are right yeah and uh for, for the listeners if you don't enjoy doing that sort of small stuff if you don't enjoy your chores uh maybe you, sh you should try it because it's, it's, it's really cool and there's a really good book on that kind of got me into taking this more seriously called the uh it, it, it this is a it's a book about like organizing your closet but i think it applies to a lot of things it's called uh the life-changing magic of tidying by marie kondo and uh she 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 has this whole business where she just goes in and essentially shows people how to organize their wardrobe and a, a lot of the technique is just teaching them how to get rid of stuff and then the stuff they keep they like here's how you fold it properly and sort it correctly and there's a certain meditative mental clarity that it gives you when you go through that process and if and if you uh, don't want to read if you're not a book type of guy i think there is a netflix show where she actually will go to people's houses and like show her method to people and help them clean their closet and they're always in tears by the end because of just how happy they are to just organize stuff so um, if that's something you, for the listeners, if, if you're not quite into that, but you, you kind of wish you were, but you don't know really where to, where to, where to, like how to get into it, I would recommend that book, The Life-Changing Magic, Magic of Tidying. So, you know, thank you for that recommendation. And, you know, on the topic of meditative, um, of meditative, what have you, thoughts and, you know, self-reflection, uh, I'm going to hit you really quick with a few uh a few lightning round questions and then uh we'll we'll work on getting you out of here is that all right hit me let's go awesome so the first question up as delivered by the lovely quote box but uh which video game character is most likely to call themselves a thirst trap despite having no business doing so and why uh what what's a thirst trap what is that <laughs> um so uh, a thirst trap would be um, someone that, um, oh man, uh, how, to, how to properly explain this. Um, <laughs> uh, give, me one, give me one second. I'm going to see if I can get a nice PG one. Um, a thirst trap is a type of social media post intended to entice viewers' attraction. It refers to a viewer's thirst um, likening their uh, attraction to dehydration implying desperation um I, I i don't know if that helps so it's like it, it's so so it's like trying to prey on people's dehydration um, to go aha uh -huh. i you you are dehydrated got you i don't know <laughs> um you know i <laughs> Uh, I let me uh, let me Google it. Let's see what I if I type in thirst trap. Uh, yeah, I think yes. I think if you read it, well, there's like... a lot of hot dudes. Uh, <laughs> it's not quite what I had in mind when I was thinking. Oh, there's some beer. That that sort of is relevant. 
Oh, oh I, I think I kind of get the vibe. All right. Um, my <laughs> a video game character that would, what was the uh, most likely to call themselves a first trap despite having no, no business doing so? Uh, I want to say, I want to say GLaDOS from Portal 2 would be my, I just, because I'd imagine if she did that, it'd be funny. Um, because she's pretty sassy, I guess. She would, she would do that, but she's a robot. So I don't know if that really, if robots can, uh, can trap people like that but that would be my answer glados okay thank you <laughs> um uh do you think the legend of zelda ocarina of time would have played much differently if it was the legend of zelda trombone of time oh i've i've played a little of this game and i didn't get up to the part where he actually has the ocarina but the ocarinas are pretty cute instruments a trombone is a very it's not very cute. It's a very, it has a different vibe. I think, uh, hmm, depends on what you mean by play. You could probably program it the same, but if you just change out a few sound samples to sound like a trombone, it'd probably be like a pretty funny comedy game. Cause it's a very like fairy type aesthetic. And if you, and if Link's trying to do something and it's like play the, I don't know what he does with the ocarina in the game, but I'm assuming he uses it to solve puzzles or something. And if he whips out a trombone instead, I could imagine that being a comedy game at that point because it just sound funny. You wouldn't expect that sound coming out of that little dude. Um, so I, I think it would, it wouldn't play differently, but the vibe would be, would be very different. That would be my, that'd be my guess. I have heard it's a good game though. Should, should I like try and I've, I've, I keep hearing Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time. Can I try and track that down? I've heard it's like okay, but I, I is it one of those like all time classics or is it is it one of those Sonic 06 type games? Oh no, it very much is an all time classic. I would oh, recommend yeah. giving it a shot, uh, as well as Majora's Mask. Um quick, quick very sidebar. Um Ocarina of Time uh you know took a while to make. Um they then spun off a quick sequel using re as, as much reused assets as they could but a very different vibe where Ooh, um, majora's mask not... is an entire game about working through um death and rebirth and accepting death and and all these kind of things it's a much heavier game um Ooh. so you know well i, well, I guess that's both. let me rephrase my answer if it had a trombone in ocarina of the trombone <laughs> of time it would also be a heavier game <laughs> by virtue of the instrument weighing more that's my answer very fair, very fair. One more for you, and then I'll work, work on you getting you out of here. Uh, what costume and abilities does Kirby inherit from you? Oh. <sighs> what costume? Uh, he'll inherit Project Feline merch as a, as a t-shirt. He'll have a t-shirt with Gabby on it. And he'll have the superpower of growing ramen noodles from the top of his head. <laughs> And being able oh. to draw and 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 have a weird obsession with CDs. That's what Kirby, that's what it would happen. So thank you for that. And, you know, <laughs> I very much appreciate, you know, you you working your way through the lightning <laughs> questions with me. Um, I apologize for whatever came up on Google when you typed in Thirst Trap. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a lot of pictures of Terry Crews. Interesting. Uh, he's, he's a pretty cool guy, I guess, sir. So. I, I I never turned down more Terry Crews in my life. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, now, Raymond, you know, as I said, um, I, I hopefully did not have not ran you uh, a little longer or too much longer than you had hoped, uh, you know, for pre-engagements or what have you. However, I don't want to take up too, too much more of your time. Um, however, if there was anything else you wanted to quickly throw out there, a cool game, what you're doing, something you feel more people should just be aware, more aware of, the floor is yours. As well, please, uh, if you have any parting words of wisdom from your experiences that you are happy to share, by all means, uh, please share those. Absolutely. So one game, one thing that people really should be more aware of is my indie game project Feline, uh, which you can wishlist on Steam right now if you type in feline in i think it's it's you just type in the word feline it'll come up there which is pretty cool so if you add that to your wish list makes me happy makes steam happy means when i release it people see it more and uh then then if more people see it then i you know more people are going to be playing it and that's just good for everyone so more people do need to be aware of that and if you're a developer kind of guy that's interested in game development, then you need to be aware of my YouTube channel as well, where I tell stories throughout the development of the game so far. 
and where I also live stream if you want to see like the day-to-day -day torture that I have to endure. Um, in terms of parting advice, wisdom, um, hmm, for, for people that are like, I, I have a lot, I do get asked a lot by people that want to learn game dev, like how to go about it. And especially in the age of information, I feel there is a lot of advice out there and a lot of it kind of contradicts as well. So I, if anyone's tried to look up what engine to use, whatever, like you'll, you'll probably reach this brick wall where there's just contradicting information everywhere. And, but part of what made it really hard for me to just, just, just teach myself things. Cause I, I'm a very sort of self-learning type guy. And one of the things that gets in the way of that is just the, what, how do you know what to listen to and how do you filter things out? And I, I'd imagine one thing that helped me a lot with, with, with doing that. And that's sort of what led me to learn, like how to 3d model, how to program and stuff is, um, is to sort of have a critical eye with, with the advice you get. So I, I, it's kind of meta wisdom, I suppose. It's it's not just, it's more like you got to be discriminatory about what wisdom you decide to let in because one thing that helps is to know where the wisdom is coming from, what sort of person it's coming from. Because uh, with 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 the live streams I do, I, I do get a lot of people in the chat like that will give me like unsolicited advice or help or like suggestions. And sometimes they're helpful and sometimes not so much. And I think... For anyone that wants to like get into like the deeper levels of like being a like wants to likes games and wants to make their own game or even just wants to learn any skill, I think knowing how to uh, pick out good and discard things from advice and not just taking all of it is, uh, is, is useful to have. And one way that I've found that helps me do that is to kind of study whoever is giving it and figuring out if you have things in common. So it's it's a bit of a hard thing to do. It took me many years to to do, but I I really think knowing what you like, what you're like as a person, how what your weaknesses and strengths are, what you're willing to tolerate, what you're not willing to tolerate. If you know that about yourself, you'll be able to more easily discriminate against advice that is compatible with your style of things. Because one thing that I picked up on when I was doing game dev teaching is that there are just a lot of people that think there is only one way to do something. And that's sometimes true, but uh, I think that there are, you know, one something that might work for someone might not work for everyone else, but it can be hard to know that if you, if, if, if there's only one thing being told or there's contradicting things, it doesn't seem like a clear right one. The right one will be whatever matches your personality the best. So if you can like know, if you can start to look at advice through that lens, of this person who said this thing to me that that gave me this suggestion, you know, personality wise, oh, he's really similar to me. He 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 hates the same things I don't like and whatever. If if you can find someone like that, it's it's it you can take a lot of their advice more. But if if the person you're being you're listening to is not like you at all, you'll you'll find that what might work for them is not going to work out so much for you. And that doesn't mean that you're you're bad. It just means that it's like the the they have different skill points. That, and they've chosen to invest them different. So it's it's better to try and take some bits that you can, but try and to find more examples of someone who's got the same skill points as you. And um that would be that would be my that'd be my wisdom I would share. Just just because that's something I've had to kind of work through when just teaching myself things online. Um it's just knowing like who you are and what will work with with your strengths and what won't. And uh yeah, that's my wisdom. So thank you very much for sharing that. And I, I understand completely what you are saying there. Um, you know, it's, it can be very difficult to, to, um, to take certain advice from people and this, you know, uh, just to kind of add on to what you're saying. And sometimes, um, you know, for, for what your vision is or what you're doing as well, you know, sometimes, uh, that, that whiz or that advice, sorry, uh, feels like it could be contradictory or, or not what you are aiming to do. So sometimes also thinking on that and maybe not taking it blindly kind of like you're saying um is is fantastic advice you know uh, especially i like the the points of uh when you're trying to find advice from from people that are more in line with what you're doing or the same kind of personality type or or what have you um just because you know that that can make a little make things a little easier makes a little more sense when you know if someone is giving you advice 
from a similar experience and not just, you know, a generalist kind of thing. Like, yeah, there's only one way to make a character jump when there's in reality a bunch of them. And the way that you're doing it in a parkour game is very different than, you know, Mario would, right? So taking advice from someone that's made a parkour game as opposed to just the general advice from like a Mario game or a Sonic game or what have you is going to be more applicable. Um, that's how I interpreted what you're saying. I believe oh, yeah. that's what is what's being said more or less. Um, well, I guess sorry, yeah, it's, 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 it's admittedly, like it's admittedly kind of, it's admittedly hard advice to describe, but I, I, to give an example to kind of help with it, cause this is something I see a lot where I'll go on, like when I was starting out, I used to do this a lot where I would like ask questions on Reddit on like how to, and it's, it's not usually even a technical thing. It's just like a. It might be even a personality driven thing because a lot of the things i find are very like personality driven like should you work in a team should you work alone uh how should you like how should you do your advertising for your game like that kind of stuff because that's all really hard to do and i think people kind of get caught up in all the different ways to do it and i remember i had this experience a lot where i would ask like i you know how do i uh how do I go about like, I don't know, securing like my first grant so, so I can fund things with production or whatever. And there'll be like 10 different people that have all completely different like angles that will come at you. And now that I'm a bit older and have, and have done some things and I've spent some time on my game, I, I can tell at a glance now when something is going to work for me and when it won't. But when I was younger, I had no way of knowing. And I, and I was like, oh, well, I'll just try this. And it's like, oh, this doesn't quite work for me because I have different thresholds than the person who suggested this. Like, you know, um, I, one one thing I remember hearing a lot was, uh, oh, you have to you have to do like all the market research and identify your target consumer and make a game for them, and that will work for people. But I found that me going about it like that just wasn't just wasn't working. And I tried just doing something how I intuitively would think to do it, and. The thing is, is that that is working for me, but even that will not work like all the time. Like that, that'll only work depending on like what kind of, like if you're the kind of guy that's prepared to, I don't know, that just intuitively, like you're lucky enough to have an idea that people want and uh, you have like the skills to do it, then that'll, that'll work. But if, if you aren't exactly like that and may, maybe your idea is a bit niche or maybe you lack the technical skills to do it, then you're going to need different advice to help you. And uh, I just find that for beginners, they, I think if you're new or especially if you're young, it's like you don't know yourself well enough yet to know what is going to work out. And it, it's not to say that you absolutely can know what will work, but I think there's, in, there's markers of like what sounds like, what will you have, a, what will you have less time suffering with like what's going to be the one that's slightly less difficult like it's going to be hard anyway but it's like what are you going to suffer less with and that's uh, that's sort of how i've learned to look at it but it, it requires a lot of introspection which is not something you can really find on reddit or or a discord forum like no one can tell you that stuff you can't ask someone else and they, they can't give you that answer it's something you have to kind of look inside for and and learn and then you know when i was doing my game i kind of did that because i i was i kind of started pivoting in the wrong direction about like a, a certain way through it where i was doing something that wouldn't really work for me but it would work for like plenty of others and i had to look inside and go is this really is this method of doing this thing is my way of going about this is this going to be the way that i'm going to actually like me am i going to be able to do it and uh it was it was a tough thing but i ended up pivoting and things have been a bit easier now that i kind of know what decisions work for me more and uh yeah it's 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 really advice that i guess it can be applied to a lot of things but i found it was i wish someone had told me that when i was starting out that because because uh yeah just a lot of people i remember meeting when i was like beginning all the advice they told me just didn't really work <laughs> but it would work for others it just wouldn't really work for me and it's not it doesn't i guess the the, the simple of it is is that it doesn't necessarily mean it's like you're bad for not following it or whatever it just means that you have a different you have to play a different game so like for devlogs because i have my devlogs and my live streams and that's worked out really well for me i don't know why but it it has but i i know that that will not be the thing everyone else will want to do like some people are really not comfortable on camera or some people really aren't they don't want to talk about their game a lot and they don't you know they don't like being in the spotlight 
So don't, if someone like that tries to do the devlog marketing strategy of trying to get the game out, it isn't going to work out as well for that person, unless they want to change who they are to work for that. But they could do that. But I, th I think there's probably a way, if, if, th if there's someone like that, that can't do that stuff, there's probably another way they could do it that would suit their personality more. And I, I know it's a very, it's very, I guess, a long, a long answer to it. But I, I think to me, that is the most important. That's what I really wish someone had told me. If, uh, if I had to like grab any wisdom from the past, if I had to go back in time and ask, that's what I would have wanted to hear. And yeah. So, you know, thank you, Raymond, for, for elaborating, um, clarifying on that. I really appreciate that. And I think anyone else that's listening, uh, hopefully they can appreciate that as well. And, you know, that's something that speaks to them that might help clear up some of their own, um, I don't want to say confusion, clear up some of the, some of their own fog that they might have experienced. They might be experiencing the same way that you had experienced it, you know? Hmm. I hope so. Yeah. So Raymond, as I said, I do, I don't want to take up too much more time. I do want to let you get out of here. Uh, however, really quick, where can people follow you? Where can they find more about you? Um, you know, well, so that way I can put that in the episode description for you. They can, uh, they, they can follow me in a few places. They can follow me on youtube.com slash Raymond Cripps. That is kind of my home. That's where I put the most stuff out. They can also, if they, if they don't have time to watch videos and they wanted just a, something quick to scroll through, that I have my Twitter at Raymond AF Cripps. And I also have an Instagram, which I post up to at Raymond AF Cripps. And, uh, is there anywhere else I am? I do have a website as well, which I should update more, just RaymondCrips.com. That, that'll that have all my links in it. It'll have some art, some music, and uh, some games that I've put up just on that site. Um, That's, uh, yeah. And, and Twitch too. I also live stream on Twitch. So YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, and my website. Link down below. Awesome. And exactly, link down below is the best way to put that one. I should so you Ray smash those links. <laughs> Please, please smash them. I need them. I smash need them. those links. Ring those like buttons. Oh yeah, ring, <laughs> ring, really ring them. I need uh, you need you need to ring them so loud that I can hear them from Australia. Then I'll know that I'll know. I'll I'll, I'll say thanks, even though you won't hear me. But uh, yeah, you need to do that right now. You need to like all that stuff. Please do it. So you know, Raymond. Outside of that, though, if there wasn't anything else, I will let you get on if your day. <laughs> I will, I will let you get on with yours too, my man. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity. You know, Raymond, I very much appreciate you making the time to have this conversation. I, I'm sorry. Um, I was about to start reading the script when I was actually trying to reply to you. I do appreciate you making, you know, making the time. I, I appreciate that you, uh, you know, we, you were able to persevere and we were able to work this out. Um, all things considered, you know, uh, uh, outside of like all the fun profits not wanting us to talk, you know? Yeah, we can't. No, you better not be telling them that we talked, okay? Because they still might hit me with another lightning strike or uh, whatever, whatever. They might hit me with COVID again or something. If they hear about this, they're not going to be happy. So, so uh, we 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 just got to make sure they don't watch YouTube or anything, or they aren't listening to podcasts. And we should be fine. I'll, I'll distract. I'll distract the gods. I'll keep them busy. I'll keep them off the internet, and then you can go post this, and then they'll never know. Okay, that that'll be the strategy. That Raymond, that sounds like a very fair deal. Uh, and with that said, though, I will let you get on with your evening now, <laughs> or on with your day. Sorry, it's daytime for you. It is, yeah. Oh my goodness, that's right. So you know, sometimes in my own brain, I think I'm in America because so many people that I see on like YouTube is very American. So sometimes I forget. It's like, oh yeah, I am in this time zone. So <laughs> I, I will get going then. But thanks so much. Like it was a, it was such a pleasure to to be on and just talk about the things I love, about games, about media, about stuff that everyone loves. Like it's, it's, it was really fun. You know, again, I'm very happy to hear that. And Raymond, thank you again for making time to have this conversation with me. And thank you for joining us on the Red Tunic podcast, as well as a special thanks to Ronald Jenkins for the use of music from the title track from Road Steep. And be sure to check out the episode description for links to socials, websites, and other means that will allow you to learn more about or support Raymond and the podcast. And while you're doing that, share, like, and follow whatever else and whatever else you think makes the algorithm work. Thanks. Until next time. <laughs>